That's an interesting one. <laughs> yes. It, it originally meant to hit. There's a, there's a myth that it was an acronym that was fornication under consent of the king that was put on people's doors in times of plague and pestilence. But it's not that at all. It just means to hit. And kestrels used to be called wind f <laughs> Our guest today is Tom Reed Wilson. He's a TV personality and a man who knows a lot about words. Hello, Tom. What a lovely fanfaronade. That was beautiful. <laughs> that was Chopin to my tympanic membrane, Joe. Fanfaronade. Yes. Fanfaronade. Yes. First question. <laughs> <laughs> what is a fanfaronade? It's sort of a very highfalutin way of saying fanfare. I was just doing it to kind of impress you, really. So, is it related to promenade? Uh, I don't think so, no. <laughs> it does end the same way, Joe. I Farinard. understand why you said does, that. But it does have that kind of inbuilt music, doesn't it? I love words that have inbuilt music like that. I think your name has it. I mean, you have a composer's name. Gustav. Yes. Yeah, not related. <laughs> he was with an H. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. I'd like to say that. I was related and that I've got as much musical talent as he had. Although, did he have musical talent? Because he just composed. It indicates a certain level of music talent. Yeah. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom Reed Wilson, how did you become so interested in words? Oh, well, it was probably my dad, really. Because my dad was an English teacher before he retired. And uh, I remember being knee high to a grasshopper and passing a beautiful, it was this time of year, and we passed a beautiful Christmas window display. And he said, what a beautiful window display. And then he stopped in his tracks and he went, window, van der Auge from the Dutch, the wind's eye. Ooh. Nothing to do with glass, everything to do with the breeze dancing in and out of the holes in buildings. And I thought, every word tells a story, it's just beautiful. And the last time we met for lunch, he also does this kind of polka of the synonyms. And he said, oh, Sonny Jim, it was lovely to see you, but all too brief, fleeting, short-lived, ephemeral. <laughs> and he just goes on and on. And I just sort of bask in it, in the kind of polysyllabic glow. I just adore it, Joe. What a wonderful description of how you came across the love for words. <laughs> how many words are in the dictionary? Crikey. Goodness. That is, that is in the dictionary, yes. It, that's one of them. It's forever augmenting, isn't it? And they have all manner of ways of checking, you know, submissions. And Can you, it, A lot of it is just volume of usage. Really? So yeah. if we used a particular word like smutter gutter. <laughs> that's a great word. <laughs> and we use that. Word. How is there an... Lim what's the number that we need to hit for it to then be accepted into the Oxford Dictionary? Oh, gosh. That I don't know. Susie Dent would know, my dear chum. Here's some. She, she would know how many. Here's some, Tom, that were added to the Oxford English Dictionary in September 2022. Mm. Influencer. Yes. Side hustle. Influencer wasn't in there before. No. But you could be an influencer way before Instagram. What? But it's the new definition, though, I think. Oh, okay, fine. Yes, as in social media exclusive influencer. So we have influencer, Tom. We have side hustle. Yes. Um, top banana, which feels like it is an earlier That's one to ancient. me. My biology teacher used to say that to me, and I mean, that was quite a long time ago. I think they've, I think they've thrown a ricket there. And gag and press. Now, you know what really surprises me about that list is that there's not a single portmanteau on it. And most, I would say 90% of new coinings are portmanteaus. Do you know about those, Joe? What's a portmanteau? Well, Lewis, <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. Yes. He invented not the portmanteau per se, but the term, because they're words that are kind of knit together in the middle, like flanter, flirtatious banter, or brunch. Because um, he used tons of them in the Jabberwocky. Words like slithy, which was slimy and lithe, cleaved together. And he said, these words that do that are like that beautiful kind of leather portmanteau carry case that has the little clasp in the middle with two constituent parts. Oh. And it clicks together in the center. And he said, that's what the words that he coins are like, like that carry case. So he called those portmanteaus too. Um, but most of the modern ones are, you know, like Twittersphere, that's another one. Um, all the kind of, 
all the technically inspired ones. I think it is about 90% of the new ones are like that. I have tried, Joe, um, in my detailed preparations for today's show to come up with a couple of Joe Marler related words that we might be able to get into wider parlance. Although I think smutter gutter is going to blow them both out of the water. Mm. <laughs> the first one I've got is marlated. <gasps> so that my definition for marlated is the delight you feel when you see your fellow podcast host. There you are. And it's a portmanteau mm. of no. marla and elated. No, that's not what that means. What does marlated mean? That means um, stuff related to me. <laughs> like s siblings and children. Are you marlated? Yeah, you malated to me. <laughs> I'm a little bit mal aroused. Ooh. Mal aroused? Yes. Mal aroused. Yes, it's a bespoke arousal that you've induced. <laughs> I'm Tom Hard. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fascination for big, gorgeous sounding words that makes yes. make a really dull sentence come alive. I really like it. Yes. But I also get really frustrated at the use of longer words that mean like short, like what's another word for hard? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> solid. Right. A longer one. There you go. So solid. Why wouldn't you just say hard? Cause it's shorter than solid. That's a good point, isn't it? Well, words I think Tom. very often little truncated words are kind of wonderful umbrella words and they can be applicable in all sort of, context but i think that solid is a little bit more bespoke it has a bit more specificity i think it's a little bit like um vibe and vibrations you know like i i actually don't like the word vibes very much because i think that you could sort of say oh do you want to take away tonight yeah i feel chinese vibes do you want to go to the <laughs> movies yes i've got musical vibes um i've got good vibes from him, bad vibes from her. It's just so kind of woolly and vague. Mind you, vibrations retains all its specificity, you know. You, you. I'm picking up good vibrations. Yes. She's giving me excitation. Good, <laughs> good, 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 good vibrations. <laughs> and it's palpable, good, isn't good. it? Whereas if you did, I'm picking up good vibes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, it falls up. off a cliff, doesn't it? Good vibes. It's shit. Yes. And it doesn't explain what is running like a kind of golden gossamer thread between your sternum and mine at the moment. Mm. That's a vibration. It's, it's true, isn't it? Yes. You know aphrodisiacs? Like oysters. Yes. And uh, zinc. Yes. Uh, magnesium. Yes. They all help with the production. With that, yeah. yes. Well... Curiously, etymologically speaking, they come from the Greek aphros, meaning foam. And you think, well, why would a kind of boner inducer come from the word foam? Well, Uranus and Coronus had a terrible fight one day in Greek mythology. Mm. And Coronus brandished his scythe and lopped off Uranus's balls. Mm. Now, had they been your balls, Joe, they probably would have sunk to the bottom of the sea. But Uranus's balls, because they were God's balls, fizzed and foamed. And out of that foam came a giant scallop shell bearing Aphrodite, goddess of love. So love was born of foam, hence aphrodisiac. Fuck. That was incredible. It all goes back to balls, Jim. Oh, my God. Just that little story, as filthy as it was, <laughs> I just lost, right, what a wonderful way to, you know, essentially you've come from, come. Joe, I'm going to help you out here. What are your favourite words, Joe, in the English language? Um, sublacious. <laughs> <laughs> words, Tom, can you help no, us out here? He's just coined a portmanteau, hasn't he, of... Oh my god, is that not a oh, word? Sublime and delicious or nice. Right, so yes. I've been saying sublacious thinking it was a real word and it's not, it's a portmanteau. So Tom words Tom, Joe has been um on a self improvement quest in recent weeks and you've been I thought you were going to dictionary and taking words out of the dictionary, but when you kept using the word sublacious, which I hadn't heard of, I thought, Oh come on, Ford Ice, you should know what this means. So it's but, not a real word. But I looked up and there's no such word <laughs> at this point, words Tom, of sublation. But you've got a hugely successful podcast and maybe this podisode will make all the difference. But what I find I think I've just coined a portmanteau. Yeah. Podcast what? and episode, podisode. Podisode. Yes. 
What a happy podisode. Oh, this is a really sublacious podisode. <laughs> I'm going to leave this room full of elation at how sublation this podisode <laughs> Was oh. it really, really was, and we're not even halfway through it. It's wonderful. What he has a, such a naughty twinkle when he. I, I, I get quite. You've got a coining twinkle. I get quite. Um, I get quite insecure actually. In in fact, I've been insecure doing the whole podcast these last couple of years because of my lack of vocabulary, and I've often lent on you to be like, oh, what does that mean? Or or I I nick your words and then I'll use them in my everyday <laughs> stuff, and then. They're like, why are you fucking using words like that when you should just be using the words that you normally use? And I'm like, because I'm trying to expand my vocabulary because I like the yes, words. allow me to grow for heaven's sake. But I still always come back to what I know and it's it's usually bleeped out a lot. <laughs> that I'm only allowed my favourite word three times, but that's never used. But you're very kind of... Uh liberal of gesture although they're not big you use your body a, a great deal and there's a big incline towards me which i find very alluring alluring yes that means to sort of love enticing all allure no trap you want me to trap you no well like a <laughs> venus fly trap <laughs> you want me to wrap you like a trap of a Phoenix. Well, actually, I, it's curious because when you said trap, it was a turn off. When you said rap, it was a turn on. Rap? Yeah. I just sort of thought yeah, it was Yeah, but isn't it also how you say it? Like if I went, oh, I'll have a chicken wrap. <laughs> <laughs> if I went, can I have a, uh, a chicken wrap? <laughs> then immediately that's something else. I think else. when there's so much of you and there's such heft behind you. Heft. I think being enveloped by you is enveloped. very alluring. So why is it env enveloped and not enveloped? Well, envelope is just the noun, and it, it's just for distinction, I think. That's all. Enveloped sounds so much nicer than enveloped. Yes, it's got a kind of lyricism, hasn't it? Don't they mean the same thing? It's the same word, but if you said to someone you were going to envelope them, it makes it sound slightly like you're going to stick them in a package and post them. You fucking yeah. speak to me like that again, I'll fucking envelope fucking you. Fucking envelope you, son. <laughs> Fuck you off to <laughs> fucking Timbuktu. Post to me devil. like that, you little But you're spot thing. on, Joe, because the envelope does envelop. I would love to envelope you. Joe, do you have another word quiz? I've got it? some words that be in this uh, episode of words that I'd like to chat about, if that's okay. Mm. Is that okay? Trenchant. Trenchant. Oh yes, to, it's like a trench. You're you're sort of deep rooted in your views and sort of stubborn. <gasps> if if I was sort of trenchant, I would have dug my trench and I would be knee deep Effective into my own. Effective, clear views. cut. I actually thought it was sitting in a trench chanting. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be stuck in. You dig a trench. You sat there and you're going, "You fat bastard! You fat bastard!" <laughs> Is it not a trench? So it's a little bit. It's something to do with trench. It is. The the root is the same. Yeah. Affable. Oh yes. Uh, easy to talk to. Um, the root is the same root as fabulous and fable. Is it? And fabulous means the stuff of fable. Really, it's it's the stuff of kind of wild imagination. And fables are so called because they were talking stories they were designed to be spoken so uh affable is easy to speak to so that so i've written my own things thinking oh that'd be a twist on it the thing but that was it i put a fable a fictional story with a moral yes. learning you are affable a, so it is related it's absolutely related oh. and you're an instinctive etymologist etymology and etymology where does etymology etymology come from? is the study of words not to be confused with entomology which is the study of entering things <laughs> <laughs> oh what a nice study um insects Tom. yes wouldn't that be insectology and endoscope endoscope end 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 what are the uh, insects without spines? End Vertebrates. Oh, in oh well, it's not, nothing. An insect it means to slice into. It's the same sect as in um, section. It's, um, it's something that appeared to the naked eye of those that coined it, like something that had been sliced up and put back together again, like oh, a kind nice. of a, a, a bug jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> We've got another ball one, actually, funnily cool. enough. Testicles comes from the Greek testis, meaning to witness. 
and um, <laughs> <laughs> and very logically that testis is in testify and testimony and Whoa. attest all those witnessy words. And then you think, well, why testicles? And it's because they are your little witnesses to semen secretion. <laughs> I would say they're not just witnesses, they're participants. Oh, big participants. I yes. thought it was because they were shaped like eyeballs. Yeah. And <laughs> because they're in your scrotum, occasionally when they're used, <laughs> they're, they're going back and forth like eyeballs. And, and they're just scrotum, get, getting scrotum like... uh, uh, comes from the word uh, quiver, you know, uh, like a quiver of arrows. It was just sort of an animal skin pouch. Well, which, a scrotum which is literally an animal skin pouch. Isn't yes, it? and it didn't begin as the ball sack. It began as the quiver. And then the coiners thought, well, that's rather like a quiver. So th because on ejaculation, you do quiver. <laughs> <laughs> is that not relative? <laughs> it is related, yep. And you know, sometimes when you're very warm and you get sort of full scrotal elasticity, there's a word for that too. In the dictionary of the vulgar tongue, it's called whiffles. 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 W H I F F L E S. That's a wonderful dictionary. Oh Joe. my You'd god! You'd love it. Francis Gross, the dictionary of the vulgar tongue. When Johnson was writing his dictionary, he said, oh, "Well, that's fine that he's sort of doing the proper one and the very formal one." But he said, "There's going to be all this." language from the pubs and the brothels that gets lost because he's too sort of snooty to put it in. So he made his own dictionary of the vulgar tongue. Is vulgar related to vulva? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with the quiz. Uh, poignant. Oh, yes. A kind of lovely... Um, if it has poignancy, it's got a kind of lingering sentimental quality. Yeah, slightly melancholy or vulgar. Yes. No, it's a French ant that solves murder mysteries, <laughs> mainly, mainly on trains. <laughs> poing, 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 ant. Poing, wow, poing. That was a, that's a push. That one. Panacea. Oh, a cure all. Yes. Yes. Um, is that Greek? The, yes, the pan is the all bit. Um, like a panoply is a kind of selection of everything and uh, a pansexual is someone that's attracted to every kind of person um what else panna cotta <laughs> well maybe i don't actually know the etymology of that but it might be things all pudding, all pudding. <laughs> um well, does it mean all coated i don't know maybe i don't know gregarious oh this is one of my favorite words. Gregarious. Etymologically speaking, gregarious means um, attracted to the flock. The Greek, uh, Greg, is it Greek or Latin? Anyway, the Greg root means the flock. So if something is egregious, um, it means it's outrageous in a manner that's away from the flock. The flock will find it distasteful. Um, and if you are gregarious, you are drawn to the flock, and therefore you like socialising with them. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Joe? It means Greg James is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Arius. <laughs> Greg Arius. Oh, Greg is hilarious. Um, a couple more then. Uh, prattle. Last night. Oh, This yes. is one I learnt today as well. Prattle. Relieve this blustering prattle, which is kind yeah. of... Um, prattle. Uh, Overblown talk, really. So is that where prat comes from? If I go, oh, don't be a prat. Do you know? It probably, it probably does. Stop being I such a know. prat. Might do, might it? Because yeah. yeah. this says it says talking for a long time about insignificant things. Prittle prattle, which is pretty much yes. this podcast. Um, no, no, it's most diverting. Yes, but insignificant doesn't necessarily mean bad. That's. Uh, Oh, I see mean, what you mean. Yes, I guess small talk. Yeah, it's lovely. But and, I, I and just wonder whether that, that was where Pratt, you know, it's such a lovely, I think it's quite an endearing insult. Yes. Yeah, you can you can like someone who's a Pratt. He's a, oh, Pratt. He's he's a, a bit Pratt. of a Pratt, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, acquiesce. Oh. Acquiesce. Yes, to kind of uh, um, accept a request. Uh, no. No? No, it's an underwater princess. <laughs> Ac 
cool. <laughs> it's a real stretch with this, wasn't it? Uh, neophyte. Oh, um, well, the near is new. Someone who's in love with the new? Yes, I guess. Oh, no, but that would be neophile, I guess. Neophyte, yeah. meaning young or inexperienced. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. So me. So what's neo? Neo's new. New. Fight is. So it it is a representative of the new. Okay. Um. So young. So yeah. neo or a product of neophyte me. Geriatric. <laughs> <laughs> Tom. <laughs> no. No, no, he He's is. In his second flash at best. Thank you, words, Tom. Or at worst. So it's either, yeah. words, Tom. Podcast. It's either someone really old, or it's uh, a magician. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. It's a magician doing a trick for Jerry Fuck's Adams. That's an interesting one. Fuck. Yes. It it originally meant to hit. There's a there's a myth that it was an acronym that was fornication under consent of the king that was put on people's doors in times of plague and pestilence. But it's not that at all. It just means to hit. And kestrels used to be called wind fuckers <laughs> because they would beat the wind as they flew. Don't all birds beat the wind? Well, I think a kestrel does a little bit more liberally because of its wings. Kestrels were originally known as wind fuckers. Yes, indeed they were. You Fuck was a very neutral word. Neutral? Yes. So when when did it become so commonly well, used to go of, sadly, as an insult? or to a lot of those hitting words transmuted into the world of sex, like banging. You know, it's, it's such a shame. Because I don't think I've ever banged anyone. No. Or been banged. No. I think it's always been a, a bit more of a corporeal undulation in my bedchamber. <laughs> a tussle of the eider down. I'm going to have to take a small break. La vie um, horizontal. A large break. <laughs> um, and then we'll come back. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, people of the world, the Joe Marla Show is going on tour in 2023. Like, properly on tour. A real life tour. Tour tour. Our debut show sold out within six hours. What the f was the line? This time we're going even bigger. We're going even bigger, are we? This time we're going even bigger. We're going to Glasgow, the London Palladium, Birmingham, Manchester, and Bristol. Cider. You'll see glorious scenes like this. This! The of the <laughs> oh. And this! <laughs> Go and get your tickets now! Click the link in our bio or just search for the Joe Marla Show live tour. Please. I would like to continue words, Tom, with the origin of various rude words. But before we do, why are certain words considered rude? Because they're fundamentally just a collection of letters. Well, I think context is everything, Tom, because, uh, you know, we were talking about fucking, weren't we? And how that was sort of basically originally hitting or banging. Um, and then its context made it very, very naughty. And uh, in <laughs> in um, the Miller's Tale, ah! yeah. Chaucer, ah! Chaucer, ah! Chaucer. I'm not the one getting in trouble now <laughs> because there is no trouble. That is my fucking favorite. We are allowing it. I'm afraid it's, in, it's really important to discuss the etymology of all words, including that word. Yes. Well, Chaucer said very neutrally in the Miller's Tale, he grabbed her by the quaint. And that's what he was talking about. And it was just a very, very innocent anatomical word. And then... So it merged from quaint? Yes, it did. And then it truncated slightly. Speaking of 
uh, Conti and eponyms. I just, they're one of my favorite, favorite word groups, Joe. That's when a word comes from a person's name. And we have tons of them. We have um, Hoover, we have uh, Bloomers. Do you know about Bloomers? Amelia Bloomer was born in the States in 1818 in May. Well, now that you know her name and her dates, what else is there here to say? She stood up for women and fought for their rights by speaking and writing with passion. And something important she had in her sights was bringing them freedom through fashion. <laughs> she campaigned for clothes that were roomy and loose, a new kind of ankle-length knickers. And bearing her name, they were soon in wide use, in spite of some naysayers' snickers. The, from Friends. <laughs> you know when they go, uh, <laughs> Rachel's like, she works at Bloomies or something. Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's. Is that her? No. Oh, fuck. No, she was a Victorian postmistress. From America. From America. And she said, I can't do my round in these long Victorian skirts on my bicycle, yeah, on her enough. trusty bicycle, because she couldn't move. And uh, she wanted to do it quickly and efficiently. And she didn't invent the bloomers, but she hugely popularized them so much so that they now bear her name. So she's a fashionista. She was. Ooh, nice. And uh, that little eponymous poem is uh, from my children's book and there must be oh, there must be about 10 eponyms in there including so it's called an eponym an eponym when and a that's word erogenates erogenous that's when a word erogenates from my nipples um, <laughs> when a word from a person's name and so you can have like a um, in Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins is the eponymous character because she's the character mentioned in the name of the movie. Oh, right. Um, so I could, instead of saying, cool, I drive a Ford KA, I actually drive a Ford Ice KA. No, not unless I invented it. Did you? No. Can't use it. Just doing podcasts for a living. <laughs> right. What about Tarmac? Is that one? Is it? Is it one? Tarm Macadam. I think the bloke who invented... This road surface was called Macadam, and he was Scottish. Oh, uh, I And it's the tar see. of Macadam. Because Macintosh is one, is it? and so is Tupperware. Is it? Tupperware is another one. And, in a very macabre way, Guillotine. Oh. And actually, uh, I think it was Joseph Guillotine. He actually made the Guillotine to be kind. Because before the Guillotine, when people were being sort of hung, drawn, and quartered, it, ah. Deaths were very, very painful, and he thought, if only I could uh, invent a, a method of capital punishment that was absolutely instant, dependent, of course, on a very sharp swift flip. Swift, yes, very swift, very and swift. that they wouldn't feel anything at all. So uh, he invented the guillotine, really, as an act of altruism. <sighs> a bit it's weird, though, isn't it? It is. I'm it being is. kind by chopping your head off. <laughs> but in the old days, didn't they? Words on the head issues with blunt axes, didn't they? So if someone was just going to chop your head off, they might be <laughs> hacking away for a while. Yes. And you'd be like, oh, oh there are so many stories about that where the kind of waiting basket was sort of sad and empty. Here's one for you, Joan. Denim. Denim. Oh, yes. This is a, it's a cracker, isn't it? Words this is a toponym. Denim. Oh, it's a what toponym. It's called. Yeah. Words to some explain. Denim. Denim uh, came from neem in France, so it was a product of neem or de neem and it wasn't a, a fashion product it was a very very durable thick fabric that suited workers um who were kind of uh, working in the fields and they wanted something that wasn't going to have sort of all sorts of abrasions and holes very very quickly so uh they invented this product and that's a toponym which is when um a, a, a word comes from a place name right for Okay, what about this one? While we're on the subject of clothing, Tom, what about corduroy? Oh, gosh, I don't know about that. Well, I might be making this up, so apologies if I am. But I No, thought corduroy, I love it. Because corduroy is a lovely soft fabric, isn't it? It's yes. nice to wear corduroy. I thought that was cord du roy, so the cloth of a king or of the king. Oh, oh I see. But I could be wrong. So that no, could I also think, be I a toponym. I think you're ever wrong, Tom. I think you're self-effacing. It's I wrong loads. You're ever wrong. <laughs> Fucking really wrong loads. I don't think there are any chinks in him. I think he's a chinkless guy. <laughs> so next time, Joe, you're down the stoop 
and you see Harlequins fans almost to a man or woman dressed in corduroy. You usually pop- salmon. It's usually salmon. Or red. No, <laughs> red. Or mustard. Corduroy, mustard. You can pop over and say, do you realise you're wearing the cloth of a king? Um, why is the language of Shakespeare so hard to understand? Well, um... I suppose because the sentence order was more akin to European sentence ordering uh, in Shakespeare's day. You know how uh, the French will say, um, je t'aime, which means I, you love. And Does it? Yes. I so mean, it means I love you. It means I love you, but in order, it means I, you love. Because oh. you put the subject before the affection or before I, the emotion. I, you love. And a lot of Shakespearean language has that kind of inversion of where we would typically put uh, the verb and um, right. uh, and uh, the uh, emotion. So it's 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 a, it seems like a little bit of a jumble to contemporary ears, but... It's a very romantic jumble, I is think. It, is it and true also, he like invented? Oh, he was the over most, a thousand. Like he just kept inventing words, and people the, like, oh well, Shakespeare's the most it, so. liberal coiner. I mean, the green-eyed monster that comes from Shakespeare, <laughs> the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. Um, oh, lackluster! All those lack words. He had loads actually. Um, uh, lacking luster meant lacking shine, but he also had lack brains for idiots and. Um, and uh, fucking behave. <laughs> <laughs> just glanced at you, Joe, just out of interest. That's all I did. Um, uh, and some sadly lost ones like Fadge. Fadge. <laughs> yes. Fadge. Fadge was one that Shakespeare used a lot in his plays, um, meaning how will this unfold? How will this turn out? Oh. So he would often say, how will this Fadge? So to, to Fadge it up, does that work? No, that, that, to unfold it. No. Fadge. F- yes, I think it's completely obsolete. But I say vag, as in... Yep. So is that related A little to that? truncation of, of that. Of vagina. Yes. Well, I suppose that's a very raveled up thing, isn't it? Vag. It's sort of, there's a lot of tissue that's all mm. raveled up. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I've got a very brief quiz for you. <laughs> no, mate, I'm looking... <laughs> ra- ravel up, a load of tissue. Fuck off. We're back to the Yonis again. Oh, you've got a very yonic vase out there. Yonic? Yes, like a vulva. And there's one just out there. It's very contemporary and very Oh, chic, yeah. Was that the one you it's... were trying to play earlier? Yeah, I, was, I thought the words time that it was like a wind instrument, so I asked Joe to play it. So there may be something else going in my mind. But it's got a I lovely yonic at... hole in the centre of it. Have you noticed? And actually, if you look at the structure, the whole thing is very yonic. I love it. I follow the Volvo Gallery on Instagram, and it is fascinating because it's a celebration of the whole gamut of Volvo. You gamut. Know, yes, yes. Uh, it it celebrates those that are like the world of a bloom, and those that are a bit more frilly, and those that are very kind of uh, 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 trimmed. It's absolutely beautiful. Have, this, this is taking us words time, Joe. Do you you remember this words time? We recently did an episode about museums. And we came across the Great Wall of Vagina. Great Wall of Vagina, yes. yes, it's absolutely brilliant. But how have you managed in your description of vaginas to sound non-offensive at all? Like, Well, I'm looking at it really through a feminist prism, I think, because I think we talk about phallic imagery all the time. I would argue that in nature there's much more yonic imagery um and yet people don't really know the word because you have the yonic whirl of a bloom you have the yonic cleave of a valley even the way my sleeve is hugging my wrist is kind of a a yonic hugging of my appendage you've got this wonderful ability to talk about smutter gutter (laughs) (laughs) and yet it doesn't sound like smutter gutter it sounds wonderful and Somewhat calming. That's so essentially, you've just talked there, about darling. a really crude description. You go, oh, her vagina looks like a wizard's sleeve. <laughs> and you've managed to go, uh, euphonic um, blooming of the sleeve is just wonderful. And yet I'm saying the same thing as you, yet you would be accepted and I wouldn't because you know you of the, language the most 
apposite word there. Apposite. So, yes, the most appropriate word saying euphonic. Euphonic. Because euphonic is sweet sounding from the Greek, um, which is why you get euphoniums and euphemisms, which make very oh, dark wow. things in life sound sweeter, like pushing up the daisies or cashing in your chips instead of dying. The pool. Yes, that's a euphemism for pooing. When would you have a shit in the pool? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, you wouldn't uh, if you had some euph sort of euphoria. issue. What's euphoria then? Um, uh, that's a sweet state. But it's the same youth. Yes, absolutely. You see, you're such an instinctive etymologist. Euphor yeah. Etymology. Even the word etymology. It's a nice word, isn't it? Etymology. It's like San Francisco. Does it send a tingle to your home entertainment centre? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think my home entertainment centre is in use. Um, it's just numb. Oh, no, Might as well be a, uh, a eunuch. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Joe, so I'm going to give you a very brief quiz. Um, of the ten most common words in the English language, how many do you think you can name? Ten most common? These are the ten most common words. I've got them written gosh, down. No looking at, at my pad. The. Correct. I'll cross these out. Hang on. That's yeah. the most common word in the English language. That's number one. At. Not on the list. What? Ooh. Gosh, I might have gone for that too. Is is a a word? Yeah. Yes, that's in there. That okay. is. Hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, are they? You've got them in properly in order. I think order. so, but my oh, research six. is not to be relied upon. Words, Tom. So, double check this before using this again. I <laughs> probably I probably won't. But yeah. Uh, drink. <laughs> <laughs> ah. think, think small words. It. Yes. Ah, yes. Hang on. No, it is not in there. Really? Yeah. See if you can read my writing words, Tom. It's quite difficult. But. No. And. Yes, yes. I thought that was One, two, three, four, five. Fifth for and. Think of all the uh, connecting words. Mm. Uh, hyphen. <laughs> <laughs> like, um. I have to uh, pee. Blank. Uh, blank. Oh, I have no, to blank. It's just blank. too many blanks, isn't it? <laughs> it's just all blanks. Two. Yes. Yes. Third. How many have I got? This is a really long quiz. You've got one, two, three, four. Do one more and I'll give you the remaining five. You're on the right lines with two. Three. Ah, oh, he's being Shakespearean again. One. One. What? We all say... To blank or not to blank? That is the question. To... to, to what is... Your lips are about to make it then. To... We talked about them this before we started recording oh, the podcast. Oh, yes. The boy bees balls dropping off when they have sex. To come or not to come? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different story, that one. To be... To B. 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 E. Is number two. I'll give you the remaining ones, Joe. Of. In. That. Have. And another one letter word. I. Yes. Fuck, we've got some shit words, haven't we? Why do we use such shit words? <laughs> do, but I guess they're a necessity. They're the aren't trampoline they? into the all, the, the, all the other lovely words. The camper. The trampoline. The trampoline. Yes. So without them. Yes. Without the subject and without the connecting words. Should you we just use try the lovely words? I just want to try. Um, let's see if we can talk without them. Oh, crumb. Can you? Tom Reed Wilson. <laughs> Me. <laughs> it's got to be a sentence. Ah. Uh, uh, it is. Me loves. Ways <laughs> of oh, Ob's in there. Is it? Uh -uh. Me, 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 Joe, <laughs> me, Joe of the me, uh, uh, me, Bob. Joe Marla tribe. That thou art, thou art, thou newest etymologian in loveth, in loveth, <laughs> withith your mouth. Thou, <laughs> thou beest my. Beloved. See, why don't we talk like we used to talk? T. 
his redundant uh People haven't got time for it anymore, have they? <laughs> I think that's the thing, isn't it? We have to truncate everything. Well, this is the speed of the world. We want everything now, 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 yes. including yes. information, which essentially is what you're doing when you're and talking. You're giving out information on how you feel or what you want or whatever it is, and we need the speed of it. So we go, let's go with the shortest rather than Ieth doth <laughs> wanteth a cup of teeth. Right, right, and say, Giz, cup rhythm tea. and speed is very, very contagious, even in nature, because birds sing faster in cities. Because what? They, yeah, they do. Birds sing faster in cities. They do. It's been measured many times. They imitate the traffic and they imitate the pace of the city. So uh, I think we do the same thing. That's why you get accents in lots of ways. That's you bollocks, Tom. That's that is, sorry, it's bollocks. Are. Never have I ever walked through London and heard a bird go, beep, beep. <laughs> like, <laughs> how do you, know? no, what they, do you mean? But, but think about accents, which actually is a beautiful word because it means a regional song. It's the same cant that's in descant, a song above. Um, but our regional songs are determined by where we are and what's going on. Accent never means a... regional song. Yes, indeed it does. And you never get a regional song of a city that's slow. Think about city accents. They're all at a clip. Like, whether it be Glaswegian or uh, Mancunian, it's very fast, it's very forward, it's very fast for speed. Cockney, it's like it's quite songy, it's quite sing-songy, quite dancey, quite forward. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Whereas if you go somewhere like the Deep South, where there's very little uh, architecturally, there aren't very many big cities, and if there is a big city, it's sprawling, you get a lovely slow lilt and drawl because there's loads of time to speak and ingest the world around you. You know, it's... Oh, it's, my God, you're right. Yes, isn't you're it right. funny? Like people from the countryside talk, Fucking yes, going yes. In. The West Country is. Re, it. Bob, how you doing? We're be go. Where are you to then? We're, <laughs> we'll go down, down, down by wheat sheaf. Where are we? By get point is sorry, you know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas if you go to Liverpool, they're like, hang on. Let's go down the pub for a couple of bevies and let's do it quickly. Fucking hell. Yeah. I just want to fucking suck your cock. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they said to you in Liverpool? <laughs> All the time. Oh, All heck. the bloody time. It's your car. Oh, my God, it is. I never thought of it like that, that depending on where you live, actually. Well, obviously, I knew the accent, but the actual speed I've never considered. Yeah. Think about Australia, a massive, empty place, and they speak super slowly in Australia. Mate. Mate. Instead of mate, they're like, mate. <laughs> fuck, mate. <laughs> mate. <laughs> Fucking shit. None. How good how good are you at Scrabble then? Seeing as you're the fabulous etymologist you, know, I, that you are. I don't think Scrabble is the logophiles game. I really don't, because actually it's all about cleverly putting very short words in very uh prize giving places and making sure that you've got a short word with a very uh high scoring letter, which is normally a very curious letter. And if you like to kind of flex your polysyllabic muscles. You don't really get to do it at all. Just, <laughs> I don't know what to do after every sentence. <laughs> your every sentence sends tingles all over my body. Like oh, poly, on a cellular poly, level. Poly what? Polysabic. Polysyllabic. Polysyllabic. Lots What's of that? The, well, poly always means lots of. Yep. Um, uh, polychromatic. Lots of colours. No, but what's polysyllabic? Polysyllabic, lots of syllables. Obviously, I'm really fucking. When you before you say stuff out loud, think about it. You fuck. I think you're polycellular, which oh. I've just kind of coined because you're such a big boy. There's just a mountain of cells, a Kilimanjaro of cells. In fact. You're more like a Vesuvius than a Kilimanjaro because there's sort of a sense that you might erupt with kind of warm molten lava at any given moment. I do want to sort of strap on my crampons and <laughs> and get to your summit somehow. <laughs> I'm only at base camp at the moment. You're oh. <laughs> 
How do you get away with it? That's what I'm saying. You're basically saying you've got like loads of meat and flesh about you. <laughs> um, I'm comparing you to a volcano that could erupt, which essentially you're talking about a penis frothing. <laughs> and But the way you say it is just so poetic and... Oh. I think I think you did read a big smut dump into that that wasn't there. I didn't. I know exactly what you were trying to do. You were trying to erupt my volcano with your words, and you succeeded. Well, you shouldn't clamp your face on my microphone, then, should you? That's that's a fair comment. According I can't, to the I can't, can't get away from you, Joe. <laughs> According microphone to the is very interesting etymologically. Why? It well, just means it be, a small telephone. It, <laughs> well, it kind of does. It means small sound, apropos the sound that's put into it from our larynx. But as any performer knows, you never put in a small sound. And how does it then correlate with megaphone, which is apropos the sound that comes out of it and nothing to do with the larynx? I think it's a dotty etymological blooper. That is true, actually. Microphone and megaphone. I think it should be called... Is it just because the megaphones are bigger, physically? I think it should be called a macrophone. I think yeah. we should rechristen it, and I think, especially when it has your face on it, it should be called a macrophone. Because it's big. You look flattered, John. Uh, <laughs> do your Scrabble fact. According to the Guinness World Record, <laughs> the highest score ever recorded in a Scrabble tournament is 850. Christmas. Achieved by Toe Weeben. Toe Weeben. Toe Weeben from Singapore at the Northern Ireland Scrabble Championship in Belfast. Oh, I see. Highest. Well, can you guess how many points he got for his highest word? Oh, gosh. How many words do you play each? Approximately 20. So good maths that. Uh oh golly. So it would be about 160. Uh, let's say let's say 170. His highest scoring word yeah was 275 points. Oh crumbs, I was 100 out or more. And would you like to take a stab? At what I don't know why pause does stab. <laughs> to you, do... you looked at words, Tom, as if your use of the word stab was going to flummox him. <laughs> it wasn't the actual word. It was more like the eye, eye contact, as I said. Would you like to take a stab? Oh, I see. Yeah. You know? See, it's all about context again, Tom. Ready? Words, Tom. Would you like to take a stab at what the word was? Oh, crumb. It begins with a B. <laughs> it's almost impossible, this. 275. And it's got to have, it must have like a... A J. Mm, uh, uh, I'll give you. Well, it's got, it's got, got an, an X. X. Yeah. X, yes. Oh. I'm going to give you a bit of a steer here, worse Tom, because I think this is a near impossible question. It is an ore or a metal. I don't know which one of the two, but it's a sort of you dig it out the ground. Oh, I was going to go for buxom. Mm. But no. Oh, gosh. No, it's got to be longer, hasn't it, than buxom? Um, but, no, I, I can't get it. I don't know how to say it. Be uh, beautiful bauxite. It's called bork. What's it called? Bauxite. 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 Oh, I say. Yeah. He Never must heard have been very clever with his placement with that because it's quite a little word, isn't it? Bauxite. I mean, his X must have been on a triple letter, and then the whole word must have been on a triple word before. Joe, can you? Onomatopoeia. Oh yes. A Onoma word. Onomatopoeia. A word that sounds like what it is, like pop or squelch, or um. Burp. Sizzle? Is that one Sizzle, or not? Sizzle, yes. Yeah. What's I your favourite onomatopoeic word? I think pop. Pop. I love the word pop. I, I love pop. palindromes. Palindromes. Which is... Uh, is that the word that's backwards? Yes. Upwards. Or, or number. And I found that my luckiest years alive are palindromic Um 11, 11, what? no, my, my my actual age. Oh. Um, 11 was a wonderful year. Um, my parents divorced, which sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually really lovely because I got to know them much better when they divorced. And then I was like, oh, I really like you, both of you. Um, and 22 was a very good year. 33, which I know you can't believe I've hit. But 33 <laughs> was a very good year. 
I'm somewhat flummoxed by uh, <laughs> the way you look and that you couldn't possibly be over 33. <laughs> if I use flummox. Yeah, though, it's nice. Thank you. Tem, je tem, really like je. flummox. Onomatopoeia itself, though, I really like that word. It's onomatopoeia. It is a on great word. On a matopoeia. On a matopoeia. <laughs> on a matopoeia. Sounds like you're on a sort of saturated mat of some kind. <laughs> on a mat of piss myself. <laughs> <laughs> Words, Tom, where do you stand on emojis? Because I'll be honest with you, on my phone, I have disabled the emoji keyboard. Have you? On the basis <laughs> that as someone who writes for a living, then emojis are a direct threat to my livelihood. Because if people just use pictures instead of words, I'm screwed. Well, I think we've often felt this, that, that pictures would be a death knell. Um, but I don't believe it to be the case. I mean, if you think about it, hieroglyphics were emojis. Yeah. Um, so you're knocking the, the very founders of <laughs> language by saying emojis are dog shit. There's a bit of a problem with this, Tom. So often, because I have disabled the emoji keyboard, yes. often there'll be a message exchange where people are communicating in emojis. So, for example, for Arthur's football team, the manager will put out details of the next match and ask for a single thumbs up to indicate if your child can play. So on the WhatsApp messages, you'll get thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. And then from me, you'll just get the word yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> or sometimes so I'll have to write the word thumbs up. They've given it an understudy, the emoji. Oh, I see. Isn't that fascinating? It's nice that you have that agency, though. It's like the girl that... Uh, wanted to put glasses on any emoji. You know, she was oh, fair enough. A, as as a kind of champion and uh, and lover of ocular framing. She uh, was cross that it was only on the geek emoji. And she said, I'd love to have the option to put it on any old emoji. And she did. You, she have, had... this, you have this wonderful ability of using all these long and incredible words. And yet not once in listening to you have you come across as smug or, you know, know it, or like you're doing it. I often find when a lot of people will use the bigger words that I'm not quite, you know, they're using it in order to sort of make a point of, I know more than you. It's like a power or, play, isn't it? Yeah, it's more like a patronising. And not once since listening to you, have I felt like that? I could just continue to listen to everything that you say. What did you say? A locu ocular framing. Ocular framing. Yeah. Um, glasses. Glasses. Right, yeah. Yes. Couldn't just say glasses, no. <laughs> 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 that would be boring, wouldn't but it? But Tom had also, because he was talking about emojis with glasses, so it's much more elegant, isn't it, rather than repeating glasses to find a but way of reframing it. I s that uh, I have to say, I'm I'm deeply, deeply touched that you said that, Joe. But I think it's to do with what the sort of pursuit of the polysyllable is. What's what's the reason for it? And for me, it's that it's very, very physical. You know, it's not intellectual at all. It's sort of oh, that dark cavern of my mouth has got a bit lonely. Let's send something there that hasn't, <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't been there for a while. You know, that dark cavern of my mouth has gotten lonely. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I'm taking away from it. That is, I'm going to use that every day for the rest of my life in whatever context, like whether I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, You're being interviewed post match. I'm thirsty, being interviewed post match. Or <laughs> talk to us about your books please. Oh, yes. Um, You've written two books. I've written two books uh, on the subject of etymology. And one is for children. And it's a kind of etymological dance through the alphabet. And uh, each word has a poem um, that has the etymology woven into it. So I'll give you letter A. No, I'll give you letter J, because Ooh, your name is Joe. Yes. Jenga, here's a dauntless claim. Jenga is my favorite game. To further praise its skilled creator, giant Jenga's even greater. <laughs> if, dear reader, you've not played, the rules are easily conveyed. Build a tower block by block. Take one out, watch it rock. As you place it on the top, pray your edifice won't flop. The name of Jenga fits ideally 
meaning build, but in Swahili. <laughs> that is so good. No way. <laughs> yeah, so good. Jenga means build in Swahili. It does. Would you like the first one as a bonus? Is that from your children's book? That's from my children's book. I, I'm going to read this book. I want... That's not a children's book. That is a fucking... <laughs> I've got a copy for you. Oh, my Superb. God. Somewhere right. I've Can got we, a copy for um, you. delve into uh, pod, uh, word Tom's... Where's he gone? Quiver. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my my deep arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I've, got, I've got another one for you, which is the start of the whole book. Aardvark, letter A. Aardvarks, like pigs, have a lovely long snout for sniffing where termites and ants are about. They snuffle at night time for all they're worth and use their strong claws for digging the earth. In Dutch Afrikaans, we are given a clue by splitting their name from one into two. Aard is the earth and piggy is vark, for only an earth pig eats ants in the dark. I'm this fight is, you for this book. This is <laughs> fucking brilliant. Oh, darling. And then the adult one just contains all the smart that I couldn't put in. Superb. Oh, my giddy aunt. I can't wait to read these. Oh, this well, is just my favourite. Just hope what are they, what's the What's the child, children's one called? It's called Every Word Tells a Story. And uh, the adult one is called On the Tip of My Tongue. Yeah. I can't wait. And we can get them wherever... You sell Wherever the books, books now. are sold, yes. I think every Waterstones and Amazon and all of those places, are, I'm probably not allowed to say them. That's fine. But you say all the places. <laughs> Absolutely fine words to Hang on a minute. Hang on. You've got an issue with saying different shop names, <laughs> but you've happily dropped the bomb <laughs> for <laughs> the most we've ever had on episode. Do you know what I mean? Oh, this no. wonderful orator with wonderful children's stories is actually the king of Smuttergutter yes. and dropped the that's egregious. At least he 11 times on this episode. That's egregious. Away from the flock. Again, oh, you're so, something that outraged the you're flock. You're so sublacious. <laughs> gregarious. Oh, and... my portmanteau prince. <laughs> you have, you really have become the doyen of the portmanteau, haven't you? You really have. He's brilliant. The doyen? Yeah. You're, you're just... The leader of portmanteau coining. You must have done eight in this episode, At in least. this podisode. Tom Reed Wilson, thank you so much for coming on. You've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for having me, boys. Oh.